Hi, welcome to this video on Cargo.toml, a deeper dive. My name is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley, and this video goes into a bit more depth on the Cargo.toml file than the Hello World was able to. So what is Cargo and what is Cargo.toml? For the purposes of this video, you can think of Cargo as automations for the Rust package. It automates building your package and automates retrieving code that other people have written so that you can use it in your own package. Cargo does more than that, but let's just stay focused on that for now. For those of you coming from web development, Cargo is like NPM. Cargo.toml is a file that contains enough information for the cargo automations to work. It holds basic information regarding your package. It also holds all the dependencies that you want to include. We'll be going deeper than that, but for a large portion of the people watching these videos, those two things are enough to be functional. For those of you coming from web development, cargo.toml is similar to the file package.json. The extension toml in the cargo.toml file name stands for Tom's Obvious Minimal Language. Reading and writing to the toml file is quite intuitive. Cargo is the automation, and cargo.toml tells cargo what it needs to know to do its job. So let's see how that looks. We're going to open up the cargo.toml file we created in our Hello World video. At the top under package, we see some basic information. The name, version, authors, edition. It's your responsibility to increment the version as you make changes to your code. So let's spend a little time on that. It's recommended you use semantic versioning standards, meaning you have major changes, which update when you have breaking changes to previous versions of your package. Minor changes, meaning you only added functionality, but didn't break anything from previous versions. And a patch, meaning you're not adding functionality or breaking backwards compatibility, you're only fixing bugs under the hood. At the start of your project, it's convention to start your version at 0.1.0. .0. For more information on semantic versioning, you can go to semver.org. You can include multiple authors in the setting if you like. That's why it's surrounded by square brackets to indicate it's expecting a list of items. The addition is optional and will default to 2015 if you don't specify it. I want to use the latest, which is 2018. This doesn't indicate when your package was created. It means that you're using the REST edition of 2018. I recorded this video in 2019, but if I put 2019 in there, the compiler won't work. There are additional optional fields that you can add, such as documentation, to specify where your documentation for your package is, or exclude and include options, indicating what files to explicitly include or exclude, workspace options to configure a custom workspace, publish options, and many, many more. For more information on optional fields, you can visit this URL. Using someone else's code is known as a dependency. Hence the name, your code depends on some other code. It's an effective way of leveraging the hard work done by others so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Here I added a placeholder for dependencies, but didn't actually add any. Let's go ahead and do that. Someone has already created a random number generator and called it rand. I want to use this within my code, so I type rand equals 0.7.1. The compiler may give you a red squiggly at first, but in a few seconds, it should recognize it and the red squiggly will disappear. Now your first reaction might be, huh? How did you know to put in rand, much less 0.7.1? And how did Cargo know it was valid or not? Cargo verified that it's valid by trying to match your dependency to what's posted on the website crates.io. This website centralizes the sharing of crates, or stated in plain English, centralizes other people's code so that you can use it in your own package. You can also publish your own crates to this website for others to use. Cargo will look for the dependency name, and if it finds it, it will verify the version you're requesting is valid. If you ever wanted to check by hand, feel free. It's just a simple keyword search. If Cargo doesn't recognize the name, it'll simply give a compile error that won't go away after a few seconds. Hovering your mouse over it will give you more information. Crates.io also gives you much more information such as what the latest stable version is, the crate size, documentation how to use the crate, and much more. Feel free to peruse. 
The reason I knew to put 0.7.1 is because earlier today I was poking around trying to find a random number generator and it told me. So based on some very basic information about the name and version of the package, Cargo can then verify is valid through the crates.io site and you're good to go. If you had put in a version that doesn't exist yet, such as 0.7.2, the compiler will catch it and even give you suggestions of versions that might work for you. The RAN crate also references other crates, and those crates may reference even more crates. It's a way of building up functionality. The RAND authors didn't want to reinvent the wheel in certain building blocks, just like I didn't want to reinvent the wheel with the random number generator. But notice you don't have to tell cargo.toml to also include those. All you tell it is what version of the crate you want to use and Cargo takes care of the rest. That way I don't have to be an expert in the entire hierarchy of what I'm depending on. Cargo already knows to look for dependencies of my dependencies and dependencies of those dependencies and so forth. It allows for programmers to stand on the shoulders of other programmers and we're all taller because of it. If you type Cargo build, RAND and all of its dependencies are now loaded and compiled into your package. It took about 5 seconds. Someone might say it's not reasonable to wait 5 seconds every build for something as standard as a random number generator, and they'd be right. You're probably going to reference dozens of dependencies in a non-trivial package, and if each one took 5 seconds, it would easily take a minute to build your package every time. Not feasible. However, since the dependency code won't change once you've installed it, Cargo knows it builds it once and doesn't need to rebuild it after that. So it's a one-time charge. If I type cargo build again, you'll notice that it didn't even try to rebuild the RAN crate and its dependencies. There's no need. The build is almost instantaneous. As a side note, that's also true for your own code. If you didn't change a file, Cargo will know that it doesn't need to rebuild it. When I created this dependency, I made it such that it points to a specific version. You can always point to an older version if need be, but sometimes you want to make sure you get the latest version as they become available. There's some flexibility that can automatically update your dependency for you. The first is the tilde. What this is saying is I want the minimum version of 0.7.1, but if Cargo sees a new stable patch, meaning the third digit, go ahead and update your dependency. As a reminder, a patch is where functionality was not added or removed from the crate. It only had bug fixes that didn't affect it. So, often it's fairly safe. It will go as high as the patches go up until, but not including, the next minor update, which is 0.8.0 in this case. If I had set this to 0.5.3, it would have used 0.5.3 as the minimum and then automatically raised the dependency as patches became available up to, but not including, 0.6.0. Note that if I don't specify the patch minimum, it assumes that the minimum version is 0.5.0, but the logic for the next minor version level remains the same. The high is once again up to, but not including, 0.6.0. However, if you don't specify the minor version, the logic shifts to the major level. Here it will take all version updates up to, but not including, 1.0.0. Likewise, you can use the caret to do something similar, except the version it goes to is always the major level regardless of whether you specify a minimum minor or patch level. Here, this will once again go up to, but not including, 1.0.0. Same with the minimum version of 0.5.0, and the same with the minimum version of 0.5.3. All three scenarios with the caret will go up to, but not including, version 1.0.0. The only difference is the minimum version. There's also a star that can be used like a wildcard. I haven't seen this one in the wild too often, but if you need it, it's available. You can also use the greater than sign or the less than sign, which should be fairly self-explanatory. You can also combine the greater than or less than sign with the equal sign for those inequalities. Let's now open the cargo.lock file. This file is auto-generated and keeps more detailed information about your dependencies. 
It takes your general information in the cargo.toml file and translates that to much more explicit instructions for cargo to follow. If you're creating a bin package, or in other words, a package that has a main.rs file, you should include cargo.lock in your source control. If it's a lib package, it's recommended you exclude it from your source control. Feel free to look at the file and view Rust documentation about what it does. Note, don't try to make changes to the cargo.lock file. It's auto-generated and your changes are just going to be overwritten anyways. There are other ways to include dependencies. You don't have to use the crates.io website. One thing you could do is reference the git like this. I don't recommend doing this unless you're seasoned enough to know what you're doing and you have a need to do this. Another way to reference a dependency is if you have a library package defined somewhere on your local computer. You can reference it using a relative path like so. I'm getting a compile error because obviously I'm pointing to a fake path, but you'd obviously point to a real one. Note that the starting location of the path is the same folder that your current cargo.toml is in. And to go up a folder, you can use the dot dot slash convention. You can also define what's known as a dev dependency. These are often used to create tests for your code. Since they're only tests and you shouldn't be including those in the final build, it'll omit the dev dependencies so that it doesn't bloat your crate. The cargo.toml file does more than manage dependencies. It can also be used to define build scripts, create environmental variables, help publish to crates.io, define multiple build targets, perhaps for differing hardware or operating systems, and much, much more. In all, I could create an entire course on cargo and cargo.toml by itself. Perhaps I will if I get enough requests to do so, but until then, this should provide you with enough information for you to at least be dangerous. If you want to know more about cargo in cargo.toml, I recommend the following site for in-depth and clearly written documentation. It's a fantastic resource. Well kids, that's it for now. As always, this is Doug Milford from Lambda Valley, and I look forward to seeing you next time.